So, Moses, as we've seen, is in his 80th year of his life when he encountered God. He's been living for 40 years in obscurity in Midian. But God has preserved his man and been preparing him for service and calling him and commissioning him to go back to Egypt to bring the people out. We saw him in his early days nurtured in the household of faith, brought up and schooled in the school of hard knocks in Egypt. He's been humbled in the wilderness of Midian. And he has become a servant shepherd of sheep, not his own. And now God is calling him to shepherd a sheep, not his own, but God's own sheep as an under-shepherd. And last week we saw in verses 1 to 10 of this chapter, Moses confronted by the divine presence of God. We saw him called by the divine word of God. And commissioned to the divine plan of God. But now we've hit a snag. The divine disclosure is met with Moses' human disclosure of his own insufficiency for the task ahead of him. In fact, in this chapter and into the next, he gives five excuses why he's not to go. Why he's not the man. And God gives him five reasons why he is the man and God is his all-sufficiency to go. Look, Moses personally feels insufficient. Who am I? Verse 11. But God promises, verse 12, I will be with you. Moses theologically feels unqualified. What shall I say to them? But God tells them, verses 14 to 15, he gives them further progressive revelation of his divine nature and his work. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Moses is mentally lacking the confidence. They will not believe me. But God assures him that his divine power will be manifested through him. Moses verbally feels he's unable to communicate properly. Verse 10 of chapter 4, I'm not eloquent of speech. But God says, I will be your mouth. And Moses inexcusably still says in verse 13 of chapter 4, I don't want to go. (laughs) I don't want to go. Please send somebody else. But the all-sufficient Lord, he accommodates Moses in each time. And he wants him to realise that he, the great God, Yahweh, is his all-sufficiency in this work that he is to undertake. So today we're not looking at all that, all that, but we're just looking at those first two excuses really and God's responses where we see man's insufficiency and God's all sufficient. Let's see. Verse 11, who am I, he says. This isn't a statement of wonder from Moses. Wow, that you should choose me, who am I? That apart from God's grace and power, I'm incapable of carrying out this great commission. And of course that is true. We cannot carry anything out without God's grace and power. But this isn't what Moses is really saying here. He's questioning God's choice of the man. He personally feels totally inadequate for the task. And really that is a good place to be in isn't it really when we think of God's call upon our lives we who is sufficient who is sufficient for these things humanly speaking Moses has had the stuffing knocked out of him hasn't he for the 40 years previously in Egypt he had risen to great power he was prince of Egypt he he was a judge he'd been brought up in the household of faith and then schooled further in in Egypt, but never forgot his identity as a Hebrew and his brothers and sisters. And when he saw his brothers arguing one another, he thought that was the time to bring salvation and deliverance, but they rejected him. Stephen's speech tells us that in Acts chapter 7, verse 25. And so it didn't work out, and so Moses fled into the wilderness. And there he learnt 
and schooled, wasn't he? To, to learn about servant leadership and how to shepherd God's flock and raise a family and live in obscurity. And yet all that time, he, God was just preparing his man for service. And now, God is calling him back to Egypt. Back to a world superpower. He's just a shepherd boy. He was a prince. Surely that was the time. He's physically and metaphorically in the wilderness. Who is he? Imagine it would be like me going to Vladimir Putin and saying, look, you've got to get out of Ukraine and you've got to release all the children, let all the people go back to their country and you've got to go. I'm totally insignificant. I'm totally insufficient for that. He's not going to listen to me, is he? And this is what Moses is thinking. They're not going to listen to me. The last Pharaoh, he wanted me dead. But the fact of the matter is that God chooses and raises up the insignificant. Those who are insignificant. Those who are insufficient to do the work. Paul tells us in Corinthians, doesn't he? In 1 Corinthians 1.26, Brothers, consider the time of your calling. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble of birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly and despised things of the world, the things that are not, to nullify the things that, that are. Why? In order that we might not boast. Boast in ourselves, in our own sufficiency, in our own greatness, in our own powers, in our own intellects, in our own skills. No, that we will boast in the presence of God. That God is with us. That God is all sufficient. Today people are looking for significance, aren't they, as well? Who am I? They find it in other things, don't they? In changing a human identity. From changing gender, if that is, that is possible at all. Changing your status or your standing, you get your significance or your employment or in our families or in our pursuits and pleasures. When we're seeking to be, seeking significance and prominence in ourselves, it all comes crashing down ultimately. We find our sufficiency alone in God. We find our identity in God. We find our purpose in God. We find our salvation in God. Yes, we can... We all run off into the wilderness, as it were. We, 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 we all find ourselves in obscurity when salvation comes, doesn't it? And yet God, the all-sufficient one, saves us. He calls us out when we come to our end of our human resources. When we feel, I, can't, I cannot do this anymore. And we cry out to God. And he comes, his divine presence, into our lives. And, so, and we need to be aware as well when we are doing ministry in our own strength, in our own intellect. And God uses all that, but without the Spirit's aid, knowing that everything comes from the Lord, ultimately. The Lord Jesus Christ said, didn't he? Now, you must abide in me. Abide in me and you bear much fruit. But if you don't abide in me, you can do nothing. God is telling, I will be with you. I will be your all-sufficiency. That's his response, isn't it? I will be with you. And I will bring you out. He promises divine deliverance. And you shall return and serve God on this mountain. And he promises the fruit of it. The proof of the pudding is that you will return. And you will worship me with others who you go and bring to me. And they too shall worship. 
So the simple point of this is that true Christian service, all work which is undertaken is only achievable by God's abiding presence and abiding in him. You feel insufficient for this task, I will be with you. And as Jesus promised to those disciples locked in their rooms uh, at, the res- at the death of Christ, uh, at Pentecost, they're running out of their rooms, filled with the Holy Spirit, doing the commission of God, speaking the word of God to the people. And people are brought out of the slavery of bondage and brought to God and to the worship of God. Notice what Stephen states in Acts 7.35. He says, this man God sent. So God sent as both a ruler and a redeemer by the hand of the angel. By the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Christ was with him. The hand of Christ was upon him as he went He was empowered. And the hand of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, rests upon God's people today. They were all met, his insufficiencies, with God's sufficiency. And that hand of the angel is upon us. Jesus has promised to the church that great commission. You know, you go, we commission to go out into all the world and I will be with you always to the very end of an age. And with Christ, Paul says in Philippians 4.13, 4, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We can go wherever, to whoever and whenever if God sends. We can stand before kings We can stand before world superpowers. We can go into closed countries and we can go to everyday people. And some of whom are crying out, are in bondage in Egypt, spiritually, in slavery, in their distress. They cry out to God. But all the power and all the strength and all the skills and all the abilities... And all the success of gospel is because God is at work in you. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's not about if you're personally feeling confident and sufficient and you've got all the right attributes and everything. The necessity is that God is to be with that man or that woman. Now, his second excuse, look, is theologically, I'm unqualified, verse 13. Theologically, I say here, because here we have the divine disclosure, don't we? Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So what is your name? Here's another excuse. I'm not able to expound rightly who you are. I need further theological training. If I'm going to disclose you to the people, you need to disclose yourself to me more. Is he unqualified? Well, yes and no. No, because he states, if I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, he is fully aware of the God that he's speaking to. He's fully aware he was nurtured in the household of faith. He already knows it's the God of his fathers, the God of the covenant promises of the Abrahamic covenant, the God of redemption, the God of promised a nation and a land to come and a redemption out of the bondage of Egypt. In Genesis 15, 13 to 14, God promises that. 
And God himself, after all, in verse 15, repeats the truth that he himself has uttered about this covenantal God of his fathers. Moses hasn't forgotten who God is. But I'm not sure about his generation. I believe they've forgotten who God is, many of them. For we're in the fourth generation, hasn't it, has passed, and the, the people of Israel uh, are in Egypt. And I don't think the slavery into bondage, this physical slavery, was the only slavery that they were in. It was a, a spiritual slavery for many of them too. They had imbibed the Egyptian gods. They had imbibed the culture around them. They, in all intents and purposes, I mean, it said of Moses, he looked like an Egyptian. But he didn't walk like an Egyptian. But many of the Israelites started to walk like Egyptians. Not only look like one, but walk like one. And that's the difference. Joshua says when he uh, was with the people and they were going into that promised land with a completely different generation. In Joshua 24, 14, he says, To fear the Lord and serve in sincerity and in faithfulness and put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. So they did. They turned to idolatry. They turned to and worshipped false gods. What's the lesson here? I want to say that it's necessary for God's people to pass on God's covenant promises, God's, what he, who he is, what he has done and is doing to subsequent generations. This is what we see in the Abrahamic covenant, isn't it? We pass on the God of our fathers. Abraham passed on to Isaac. Isaac passed on to Jacob. Jacob passed on uh, to Joseph and so on. And, and to, to Moses and to Joshua. It passes on. This is being passed on. But this new generation has forgotten God of their fathers. And ultimately the majority of them didn't even enter into that promise of the land. Did they? Judgment that came upon them. As we see in Egypt with Israel, we see repeated in the UK today. Not that we are a, as a nation, a Christian nation. I'm not speaking about Christian nationalism or anything like that. But Christians have flourished on these shores for, for centuries. And I don't mean as nominal Christians either. There's a lot of that. But as true believers within the nation. Because... And there's been a failure to pass on the word of God, to, to nurture our children and in our family homes, as we're taught to in Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, uh, and in God's presence and in the churches, to teach God revelation of who he is, of the God of our fathers, the God of the covenants. We, we, we need to be teaching this the covenantal theology of God, of how God progressively reveals himself and, and shows his glory and his salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ in the new covenant. We see in Judges, don't we, in Israel, they raised up a judge and they came to know God and then the generation is raised up and they don't know God. Because it needs men like Moses to go... And speak of the God of our fathers. Because people have imbibed the false gods of this age. Now, physic people are physically born, but they need to be taught about the God of our fathers because they need to be born again. And if not, they remain in Adam and they remain in spiritual bondage. So that's the first thing. But also he does need some theological training because Moses' request does ring true. We, we can never know God enough, can we? He wants to know him more. He wants to know more of God. Isn't that what we want to do? Know more of God. To know him more intimately and closely and 
intellectually and spiritually. We want to taste and see that the Lord is good. We want to stand and behold his glory. We want to meet with God. <coughs> Do we not? I mean, could you imagine it? Truly meeting with God. So, God obliges him, doesn't he? For he is the God of progressive revelation. What is your name, he asks. Not simply asking about his title, but his very nature. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people, I am has sent me to you. So he's, Moses is giving him a theological education on his divine nature, of his name, that he will be who he will be, that he is the eternal, constant God, self-sufficient, self-existent, the one who has immediate presence, the uncaused cause of all things, the almighty creator and sustainer of all things. The one who is immutable in his being and character. Never becoming anything different. The same yesterday, today and forever. He is the great I am, Yahweh. His divine name. The unexpressible name. We can't begin to compute all these things about God. But there they are. But all this education upon his divine nature is about this, really about continuing to support Moses in the fact that he will be with him. That he is the God of redemption. That I will be with you. And it's substantiated by that I am. I will be. And God is going to be known now through this progressive revelation as the God of redemption who brings the people out of Egypt. This is something extra that's going to be put on the stamp, the God of our fathers, of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and the God who redeems his people out of Israel, out of Egypt. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And that day, that Passover day, was a, a day to be memorialized, wasn't it? Exodus 12, 1 to 14. It shall be a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord and throughout your generations. And you tell the generations of what the Lord did. This is our God. This is his nature. He's a God of redemption. And so he's training Moses in this. This is what I'm going to do. By which I will be known and be remembered. But the real call here for Moses is to exercise faith. Not only in the covenant promises, but a God who is going to be with him and a God who is going to bring his people out under him. And all is in keeping with his covenant promises and his divine nature, who is a God of redemption. I want to know Christ. That's not a bad lesson. It's not sufficient also to live off past lessons, is it? Passed down to us, as it were, from our forefathers alone. Faith isn't passed on genetically, but graciously. But by God's grace through faith. But it, is, it does come through a matter of the intellect and the mind and reason. So it, he must be communicated. And God's spirit applies that. And so it comes also through the word of God. He speaks to them through the word of God. His final revelation. And the promise is that when Jesus went to heaven, he promised to send a divine educator, didn't he? The Holy Spirit, a divine helper. And what will he do? He will teach you. He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you.
So God reveals himself and he reveals his redemptive act. God qualifies and edifies so that the man is sufficient to proclaim the word of God. He's educated as well in, in the greater redemptive work. We are those who are to be schooled in Christ. Able to disclose God in all his glorious and person and work. Not only to those who are Christians, but to those who are unschooled and those who are lost. To declare his glory. The one in whom all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. To declare his redemptive work through his atoning death and justifying resurrection. God sent Moses a prophet. God sends Jesus the greater prophet. Who would bring that redemptive work, that greater redemptive work. Moses is also educated here for his prophetic, prophetic office. Verses 16 to 18 as a prophet. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, have Jacob, appeared to me. I have observed you and done you in Egypt. He's given divine insight in these verses, isn't he? Of the future events, of what he's to do. He's to gather the elders together, verse 16. He is to speak God's word of redemption, nothing more, nothing else. He's going to reveal God of his fathers. The great I am, he's... He's told in verse 18 they will receive him and listen to him. And that Pharaoh would reject him. And he would not let them go. He's, he's aware of all that God is telling him. Everything that is going to happen in advance. And yet he says in verses 19 to 20, God will deliver them with signs and wonders will follow. Egypt will be plundered and the people will exit with great possessions. There's no prophetic office like that today. The office of prophet was foundational, along with the apostles and the Lord Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. We have God's final revelation, his word of God, and that word is prophetic, isn't it? It can penetrate in that it can speak into people's lives. Aided by the Spirit of God, it exposes the heart. It reveals the intents of men and women. It convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. It brings salvation, it nourishes, it sanctifies. It educates, it directs our paths. And it gives us also the future promises of that we will be brought back and brought out by Jesus and we will not worship God on some mountain, as it were. We will worship God in his divine presence, in his glory. That's, we, we, that's what's happening to us. What's happened to them, this is happening to us through this greater prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see Moses, although a prophet, we see him here and God tells him that he's to serve alongside the elders. Do you see that in verse 18? He's to go and tell the elders and about God and what God is going to do and who he is. And then they together are to go to Pharaoh. So clearly he's not alone in this, in bringing this word. It's too much for one man, isn't it? That's what happened later on when uh, he was sorting out all the disputes, wasn't it? And Jephro, his father-in-law, said to him in Exodus 18, you know, this isn't good, you need to get elders among you, you need to get men amongst you, able to deal with these affairs. And so here he is, he's got these elders who are receptive to God's word and are serving alongside him and supporting him in his role. And that's what we need in the church. You need a plurality of elders, don't you? You need a plurality of elders serving alongside one another. When, when you're calling a man to the office of church 
leading elder or pastor, you need one who has encountered God and who's educated under God and by God, not through the word of God, that he's had a disclosure from God and he's able to disclose that disclosure to others but also that the people, like the elders within that community, recognise that and so the church recognise it and say, yea and amen to that. Look, finally here he's educated on signs following, look, verses 18 to 22. Signs always follow God's word when it's proclaimed in the spirit of God and with the mind of God and in a, a reasoned way. What is he informed about? Well, verse 18, verse 19, I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. The sign of opposition, that there will always be those who oppose God's word, those who oppose God's people, those who want to hold people in bondage and slavery. And really here, this is the great picture, isn't it, of, of the great battle of Satan and, the, and of Christ, you know, always in a battle. And Satan bruises the heel of our Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus bruises his head, crushes him, has that victory, doesn't he? But there's that continual opposition to God and all spiritual things. But God says, what will he do? He will raise his mighty hand. And Satan produces those counterfeit miracles. He's an angel of light, but he's an angel of darkness, isn't he? But God ultimately will deliver his people. And so there's always opposition between God's people and the world and all those that are opposed to God and then the side of God's powerful redemption look I will stretch out my hand and the Egyptians with all their wonders that I will form among them after that he will let you go the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders He's an angel of light. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And people are, are, are crushed and devoured in his devices this day, aren't they? And yet the wonderful news of men and women who are born of God, who are called of God and, and go out into the world that the gospel is powerful because it is accompanied with the all-sufficiency of God. God speaks. God acts. God delivers redemption to people. He redeemed us. He redeemed us. And he can redeem others and will redeem others. God did deliver his people under Moses didn't he? And God does deliver his people under Christ and in Christ. They had that lasting memorial and we have a lasting memorial. And we shall remember that this evening as we gather. And then look finally, the sign of God's favour and gifts. And I will make the Egyptians favourable, disposed towards this people, so that when you leave you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbour and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold for clothing which you will put on your sons. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. So God's people were not only delivered but they were favoured. They would be plundered, the Egyptians. They would take precious gifts and and clothing and silver and gold and diamonds and, and it no doubt used in the building of the tabernacle and the worship of God. And this is what the Lord Jesus did, isn't it? He gave gifts to his church. He, he set the captives free 
And he gave gifts to his church when he led the hosts of captives, Ephesians 4, 8. He gave gifts to men. So when we are called to go as Christians, we, we are insufficient in and of ourselves. But remember, our all sufficiency is in God. And therefore, we can go to our neighbours, we can go to strangers, we can go to far off lands. Don't focus upon your personal insufficiencies, but focus upon God's all sufficiency. For God is with us. And when you don't know what to say, remember to continue to be schooled in God's self-disclosure of himself in his word and his redemption applied and disclose God and his redemption plan to others nothing more nothing less nothing oh God has told me this and God has told me that and this is what I feel and this is what you need to be no what does God's word say give them God's word God spoke God's word to Moses and Moses went and spoke that nothing more nothing less for faith comes by hearing the word of God. And we shall see, and we do see signs following. God's mighty hand will bring redemption. The captives will be set free. And he gives gifts to his church, to his people. And they're used for his glory and praise. And we gather together. And the proof is in the pudding that others come and join us. Others are born again. Others are raised up. A church is built. And what do they do? As God has promised to Moses, you will worship me on this mount. We will worship God on his holy mountain. As we ought. And we are treasures of his. Amen. <laughs>